was a, uh, a professional baseball player back in the 40s. He ended up uh, writing a, uh, a biography uh, about his life. And, um, but he was a player that did not have the opportunity to experience all, all of the notoriety or the, uh, the salary uh, that uh, many of his counterparts. He played in the, uh, probably uh, are not even aware of this, some of you aren't old enough, but he uh, he played in a, in a black-only uh, baseball league. It wasn't until Jackie Robinson broke through in 1947 that there was any African Americans that had ever played uh, Major League Baseball before. At a reunion of his teammates, a Sports Illustrated writer interviewed him and talked him, uh, to him about his book. Uh, because with Buck O'Neill, basically, he was kind of getting old. He was an older player. So by the time that breakthrough came in, it was kind of too late for him to make the jump uh, into Major League Baseball. And uh, some of his teammates were very uh, bitter over that missed opportunity. And, uh, but he said this in that, that interview. He said, waste no tears for me. I didn't come along too early. I was right on time. I don't have a bitter story. I truly believe I've been blessed. And he went on and talked about how he believed the sovereignty of God had guided and, and directed his life, and he was thankful for all the, the opportunities that he had. So he named his, uh, his biography, I Was Right on Time. And uh, this morning, uh, we're going to look at a passage that talks about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and he comes in uh, right on time, on the time that, uh, that Daniel said that he would come to the exact day. And all along, as we've watched Jesus, many times he has said, as the crowds have wanted to make him king, he said, no, this is not my time. My hour has not yet come. But now it has, and he begins to uh, force the, the issue. A couple of things to uh, just talk about the, the setting of Jerusalem. Uh, we know from the writings of Josephus that at this time, at Passover in the first century, there would be two to three million people in the city. Jerusalem wasn't a real big city. It probably wasn't a lot bigger than downtown uh, Honolulu. Uh, the state of Hawaii's got to, what, 1.3, 1.4 million in the whole state. So there was, there was two or three times that many people in that one particular city. So when we talk about uh, crowds that were with Jesus, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. We're not talking about a couple of hundred uh, people. If you took Aloha Stadium and, uh, and filled it, you know, and then emptied it out and followed somebody around. That's, that's the idea of the types of crowds that were following Jesus uh, at, uh, at this point. One writer uh, has said that it's impossible to exaggerate the sheer courage of Jesus because along with uh, the celebration of the crowds that we'll, we'll, we'll note and make reference to, uh, you had the ongoing drama of uh, uh, the chief priests and the elders, the teachers of the law that were plotting the death of Jesus, uh, even at this same uh, point in time. And the number one topic of conversation, uh, along with Jesus and the fact that he seems to be the Messiah and so forth, the number one topic of conversation uh, during that time period would have been the fact that Lazarus has been raised from the dead by Jesus of Nazareth. And it happened right over that hill. Uh, you've got Jerusalem, you've got the Mount of Olives, down the other side is Bethany, and that's where it would have taken place. Lazarus was well known in the community. We know he was, uh, had some wealth. He was a, a man of means and so forth. And we know that uh, at that time when Jesus comes, you have the professional mourners there, many of them possibly from Jerusalem. And we'll make, uh, make a reference to that later on. We know that that word had spread quickly. And this was the, the hot topic of conversation. And it's that event in particular, like a domino that begins to fall, that basically leads us to this point here in chapter 21. So let's look first at verses 1 to 3, where Jesus makes final preparation for entering Jerusalem. 
As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. And tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. First, we know that Jesus made final preparation on the Mount of Olives. Every time he came into the city that week, and apparently was his habit to do when he was with the, the disciples, with the guys, is they would come over the top of the Mount of Olives and come about halfway down and then pause at a place we know as the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and there, they, basically, Jesus would brief them about what's going to happen. We're going to go into the city. This is going to happen. I'm going to do this and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and then as they would leave the city at the end of the day, they would pause again halfway up the Mount of Olives, and uh, basically, he would debrief them on what had transpired, uh, and, then, uh, and then they would move on and always staying at the home of uh, Lazarus and uh, Mary and Martha there in, in Bethany. Uh, this is why when Judas betrays Jesus, Jesus, he knows exactly where to go to uh, basically lead uh, uh, the um, temple priest to Jesus there at the, uh, the Mount of Olives or the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, secondly, he makes final preparation by sending two disciples into the city, and he sends them to find a donkey and her, her colt. And again, this is interesting because of the fact that uh, uh, we wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, think of somebody as being a, a, a prominent person by riding a donkey. But if you read the Old Testament, you'll read the sons of, uh, of David, you know, riding off on their donkeys and, st and stuff. So uh, uh, again, it's... Uh, uh, a, a place where uh, they they are in power, uh, but uh, and so so much so that they are they can be vulnerable. They don't need to be on a conquering white horse. You know, a general going off to war would want to you know a show of force as he goes off. But uh, again, Jesus rides into the city as the, as the conquering king, and of course, we'll note in a moment in terms of fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, it's interesting the way it's set up. If anyone asks, tell them the Lord needs it. So why, is, why the secrecy? Why the cloak and dagger? Uh, very simply, Jesus has prearranged this, obviously. Uh, he's, again, they've, they've been going to Jerusalem for the three feasts, you know, together as a group now uh, for, for three years. Jesus has been going since he was a, a young boy. And obviously, he's made this arrangement. He knows this is the day he's going to ride in, in fulfillment of Zach Zechariah 9.9. 9, and to do so, he needs to ride in on this cult. Uh, at this point in time, if, if somebody basically takes Jesus' side, recognizes him as the Messiah, it's already been known that they then would be put out of the synagogue. They'd be excommunicated. We have a reference to that in John's Gospel in chapter 9, verse 21. These are the parents whose son has been healed, and they're asking, was your son really, you know, healed by Jesus and so forth? Uh, John 19, 22 says his parents said, said this because they were afraid of the Jews, and by Jews they mean the Jewish leadership. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue or excommunicated. And there's different levels of doing that, but they would not be able to come in. They would not be able to worship and, uh, and so forth. And therefore, you get the secrecy about, you know, the guy that's made the arrangements for the, the, uh, uh, the donkey and her colt that's never been, been ridden. So fi uh, final preparations. Also, you have Jesus will fulfill prophecy as he enters Jerusalem, verses 4 to 7. This took place to fulfill what uh, was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. So, First, we note that he fulfills prophecies I mentioned by riding the, the donkey. And again, this is all foretold by the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, the, the fuller passage is, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. And then again, this is typical Hebrew parallelism. In the next line, he explains who the daughter of Zion is. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. So in particular, he's talking about to the citizens of Jerusalem. Zechariah says, in the future, the Messiah is going to come. And he's going to present himself to the citizens of Jerusalem. And he, you're going to know that it's him because, as he says, 
See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So uh, he comes in righteous, having salvation. He came in gentle, or some translations would say uh, lowly. Why? Because he came not as a conquering king, but as a suffering servant who would die for the sins of the world. He came humble and lowly as he presents himself uh, to them. Luke 19.30 tells us that no one had ever ridden on this cult before. And, and again, at least within Judaism, that speaks of a special purpose. The, uh, anytime the temple had to be cleansed for any reason, uh, it had to be done with the ashes of a red heifer that had never been yoked or used in any work. In other words, it had to be set aside, untouched in a sense, for a special purpose. Uh, the idea of this colt never having been ridden means that it was set aside for a particular special purpose. In fact, they, in that day and age, uh, they had a figure of speech that says when the first person sits on the animal for the very first time, that means the animal was, was, uh, was really designed or, or uh, was there just for that purpose. That person, and he should actually be the owner and, 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 and the writer and so forth. And certainly... Uh, all of that is indicated in terms of this particular animal that uh, Jesus rides in on. Secondly, he fulfills prophecy by arriving on time. Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25 to 27 talks about the day the Messiah would come. And we won't go through uh, all the mathematics, but uh, you remember from our study in Daniel, Daniel writing in a time of captivity. I mean, the Jews are in Babylon. And he's saying, but you're going to go back. You know, things are going to be rebuilt. It's only for 70 years. He's trying to encourage uh, the people and so forth. And in part of that, he begins to tell, again, history in advance. That's what makes Daniel such a fascinating study. And part of that, he says, when the Messiah would come. He says, you'll know that it's him because from the day that uh, the walls get built around Jerusalem, you can actually start clicking off on the calendar. And, uh, and we know the date that... Uh, Logomanius Artaxerxes gave the order to and the decree to restore and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So we know that date and we can start counting off. Daniel said it would happen 173,880 days later if you compute the Babylonian uh, calendar and you arrive at the date that Jesus comes in on, on this day exactly on an April 6th. So again, uh, he's fulfilling prophecy, Zechariah 9.9. Uh, and Daniel chapter 9 by coming in in the way that he comes in. Thirdly, Jesus is proclaimed to be the Messiah as he enters Jerusalem, and we see that in verses 8 to 11. A very large crowd sp spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So uh, the proclamation is made of his Messiahship as the cloaks and the branches are, are laid on the road. And uh, uh, we see this all the time. People go by and you lay their cloak in front of them. No, we don't really do this anymore. But it was uh, common in that day. I mean, when a king was coming and you wanted to show special honor, uh, that's, what, that's what you did. Uh, and we see that even an example of that in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 9, 11. Jehu is uh, kind of an interesting character, but he has a prophet come to him. He's like a, a military commander. And a prophet comes to him and says, uh, I'm going to basically make you ruler or king over the people in the north there in Israel during the time when the kingdom is divided between Israel and Judah uh, and everything. And, and, and uh, in verse 11 of our passage, it says, when Judah went out, to his fellow officers, uh, one of them asked, is everything all right? Why did this madman come to you? I'm making reference to the prophet as being a madman. Uh, you know the man of the sort of thing he says. Jehu uh, replied, that's not true. Tell us. <laughs> we think he's a madman, but tell us what he said. And Jehu said, uh, here's what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over, over Israel. They hurried, verse 13, and took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So again, th this whole thing is prophetic. They're laying their cloaks before him as he's coming down the Mount of Olives into the city. Again, this, this huge crowd that is made up of hundreds of thousands of people that are 
a couple of different distinct, distinct groups of people. You had the people that lived in Jerusalem that we've already made, uh, made reference to. Zechariah says, you'll know specifically. You've got the whole entourage of the people of the Galilee that now for three years have been watching uh, Jesus heal people by the thousands. There's probably virtually no one that lives in one of those 214 villages up there that haven't seen Jesus do miracles or have a friend or a family member that has experienced one of the, one of the miracles. Uh, and they have by force tried to make him king on, on other occasions when he multiplies the loaves and the fishes and so forth. Uh, they're very excited and they're, and they're moving along with him. They're a, uh, they've all got to go to Jerusalem. All the males have got to come to Jerusalem for this feast and their families are moving. They're coming along. So you have that portion of the group. Now you've got all the people that are very excited in what we'd say Judah, the, the area around including Bethany because of the fact that they know Lazarus. And they know that he died and they know for a fact that Jesus called him out of the grave uh, and, and raised him up and said, I am the uh, the, res the resurrection. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. I mean, they, they know all of this. So you've got different groups of people uh, that are all very excited for, uh, in a sense, the same reason they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they also believe that he is going to destroy the Romans. He's going to take over. He's going to set up his kingdom. Uh, very misunderstanding, again, the difference between his first coming and his second coming. Jesus has been trying to prep his guys and let them know, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to be betrayed. Uh, he's told them that at least three times that we know about, and he's included the fact that he would be crucified. But there's a lot of dynamics going on here. But at this point, there's a proclamation, the fact that he is the king, the Messiah. They put their cloaks not only their cloaks, they put down, John's gospel tells us branches and in particular palm branches uh, before him. And that's why sometimes we refer to this as Palm Sunday, the Sunday that Jesus again uh, comes into Jerusalem on this donkey. This is in fulfillment of a, a Jewish festival. Again, one of the three festivals certainly was Passover, but the one that would happen in the fall would be the Feast of Sukkoth or the Feast of, of Booth, and where they would actually, as Orthodox Jews do today for a week, they move out of their homes and move to the beach park. No, that's, uh, we do that. Uh, but uh, Orthodox Jews, they move out of their homes for a week uh, and they uh, build little booths and put palm branches around them and so forth. Uh, and they, they do that so that they can teach their kids and remember that for a time they were, they were wandering in the wilderness. But God faithfully brought them into the promised land. So now they have their homes and they're in their, their homes and they're secure. But God was so faithful and he led them into the promised land. He's going to bring his promised kingdom and he's going to bring his promised king who is the Messiah. So uh, what they're doing here is not, what, is, not, is not supposed to happen on Passover. I mean, you got hundreds of thousands of people that are screaming, they're shouting, they're singing these uh, messianic psalms, and they're, uh, they're, they're just going, he is the king and everything. That's not supposed to happen. Passover, Passover, what do we do then? We're somber. We remember our sins. You know, in a few days, the high priest will sacrifice a lamb on behalf of the sins of the nation. He will take that blood and he will pass in through the holy place and then into the holy of holies. In the one time of year, he stands before the presence of God and he will pour the blood. Now, on this, this day, the Ark of the Covenant is long gone. The, the, the only thing they've got there is actually uh, uh, one of the foundation stones from the original temple. And, and that's what he's going to pour the blood on. He's going to come out. Uh, and he's going to lift his hands to the people and bless the people because uh, that sacrifice for their sins have been accepted. Okay, now we can celebrate. Now we can rejoice. They can eat the Passover lamb. They can enjoy the Seder together. But they're remembering their sins. As a nation, they're remembering their sins um, uh, individually. Uh, and they are trusting in the shed blood of the lamb that their sins would be atoned for and be covered. So it's somber at this time. It's what it's supposed to be. But it's not. These people are going crazy. Uh, it's very different. And they pull out not just cloaks to lay down him because they want to honor him as a king, but they pull out their palm branches and so forth that are all associated with the, fe the festival of Sukkoth. Let me read uh, Leviticus 23, 39. There it says, So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, uh, after you've gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival of the Lord for seven days. The first day is a, a day of rest, a Shabbat. And the eighth day also is a day of rest. 
On the first day, you are to take choice fruit from the trees and palm fronds, leafy branches and poplars, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate. This is a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. See, that's what they're doing. They're celebrating. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord, your, your God. If you lived near an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood today and you would watch them in the fall, usually in October, build their booths, sit outside, and you would see all the kids singing songs. If you can understand them, if they were in English and not in Hebrew, some of the songs would be about the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, and that's what they would be rejoicing over. So again, what's taking place here, uh, it certainly is uh, he's being proclaimed to be the Messiah because of the fact that he comes riding on a donkey. He certainly is being proclaimed to be the Messiah because they lay their cloaks before them. But also they believe this is the fulfillment of, of the festival of, of Booths or, or, or Sukkoth. Uh, the third way that this proclamation is made is in the quote, they shout out and sing from Psalm uh, 118. From Psalm 113 to 118, or we call the Hallel Psalms or Hallelujah. It's the same, it's the same in every language. It's kind of fun when you travel around. It doesn't matter what country you're in, what language you're in, everybody says Hallelujah. The, the, the same. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, you know, Hindi or, uh, or if it's uh, in, in Japan or whatever. And uh, Melissa's smiling because they were in Hungary and they were in Croatia and Romania. And it's, it's just it's the one universal word you know, among, among Christians. Hallelujah. And, and so you have the, the Hallel Psalms. They would be sung during this time period. This is on a Sunday. It's four days before Passover. On Thursday, when the Passover lambs are being killed and their blood is being shed, uh, and that's going on in the temple, you have priests doing that. You have other priests that are singers, other priests that are musicians, and there's tremendous worship going on. So loud that you could hear it over the entire, the entire city. So we... We really can't make a biblical case for making worship quiet. Uh, it, was, it was very loud and they had no amplification. And what were they were singing? <laughs> they were singing while that was going on, Psalm uh, 118. Let me read just uh, a little bit of the, the a portion of that, verse 19 to 27. Uh, and keep in mind uh, what's going on as they're singing this and then the part that the crowd is singing before Jesus, uh, beginning in verse 19. Open for me the gates of righteousness... I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So that's, that's what these guys are, are singing. But the people in the crowd, they know that this is messianic. And they recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And they are saying it's a prayer. Hosanna or, or save now. Save us now. Save us from the oppression of the Romans. Uh, but certainly they needed to be saved from more than that. They needed to be saved like us uh, from their own sins. Uh, Luke 19.38 gives us a, another little uh, tidbit of information. Uh, they were also singing, uh, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So they, he is the king. He's the Messiah. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now that's interesting because that's something the angel said at his birth, Right? Uh, verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. A couple of things that are interesting about this. And one is the fact that all these people that are shouting this are all committing treason. They're on a Roman highway proclaiming Jesus to be the king and not Caesar. And that's treason. And they don't care. And they're not somber. And they're going ballistic with this whole celebration, this whole thing that's going on. Uh, the Pharisees are there. They're watching the whole thing. 
They understand what's happening. They know the scriptures. They know the cultural customs. They know this whole crowd is proclaiming Jesus to be Messiah. And they say to him, teacher or rabbi, uh, you should tell them to be quiet. And, uh, and Jesus says something very pointed to them. He says, if they don't proclaim me to be the Messiah on this day, those stones right there, creation itself will, will cry out and proclaim to be the Messiah. Do you get it? Uh, the, you know, sometimes we look, we look at this whole thing as, yeah, it's, it's hyperbole, uh, but it's not meant to be funny. Oh, the stones will cry out. Oh, that'd be funny. Stones singing. No, yeah, that'd be very comical. That's not, what's, that's not the, the mood here. Jesus, there, there's uh, going to be a series of very pointed confrontations between him and the chief priests, the leaders, and the Pharisees. It's been ongoing. It's building. They're plotting his death. They want to kill him. They're trying to figure out how they can do it. They feel like this whole thing is going out of control. They can see their power slipping away as they're watching this scene before them. Tell them to be quiet. Hey, if, the, if I tell them to be quiet, creation itself will proclaim that I am the king. I am the Messiah. Are you willing to accept this? So there's a, there's a real dynamic going on in this proclamation. Uh, there's some, there are those that are indignant. They're furious over it. And then there's, there's just masses of thousands of people that are, that are, are celebrating, and, and they're very excited over it as well. One other thing that I think is um, sometimes erroneously taught, and that is that how fickle the crowd is that they could shout, you know, Hosanna, save us now. Uh, you're the king, you're the Messiah. One day... Uh, and then just, uh, you know, four days later, then shout, uh, crucify him. And these are really two different crowds. Uh, that second crowd that yell, screams Cruci crucify him basically are the ones that are under the direct influence uh, of the chief priests and the teachers of the law. This is a, a much smaller group of people uh, in the courtyard there uh, of uh, Pontius Pilate. It's not the tens of thousands or, or maybe even 100,000 people that are shouting this day. Uh, and, they're, and it's just two different groups of people. Third thing, the proclamation is made because of the miracles he's done. And, and Luke tells us that in, in his gospel. But as I, as I mentioned already, uh, it's really the miracle that's been done. I mean, he's, Luke, Jesus has done thousands upon thousands of miracles in terms of healing and feeding thousands uh, and, and so on and so forth. But what has really stirred this crowd in particular, and I'll read a reference to that in a moment, is, is raising Lazarus from the dead, uh, which, uh, you know, there's a whole lesson in, in and of that self. Uh, these two gals, these two sisters, wow, that is definitely not me. <laughs> And my cell phone doesn't make a noise like that. Uh, is uh, David or somebody around that can, or it's uh, your little amp here, Mark. Do you want to, I dare not touch these things or. <laughs> it's only us. Pause right there for a moment. Oh, solution. Thank you very much. But this whole issue with, uh, think about, uh, again, that setting, and it's in John 11. Uh, Mary and Martha, uh, uh, again, their brother dies. They'd opened their home. They'd opened their hearts. Jesus has stayed there many times. They've seen Jesus do many miracles, and now Lazarus is sick. So they send word to him, and the term they use is, is that, come, because the one you love, Lazarus, is sick unto death. He's dying. They're, they still firmly believe that if Jesus can get there before he dies, he can pray for him, lay his hands on him, whatever means he uses, and, and he can raise him up, and he can heal him. They believe that he can do that. And of course, uh, you know, when Jesus gets the message, then he determines not to go, and he delays it three days. And so he can know that Lazarus is dead, and he's been in the tomb, so that no one would be able to dispute the miracle that he was about ready to do. This is all staged. Uh, this is all under the plan and the sovereignty of God. You mean Lazarus got sick because God wanted him to get sick? Yes. You mean Lazarus died because God wanted him to die? Yes. And he wanted him to die on that day? Yes. And it meant that Mary and Martha were going to have to go through a time of suffering and heartache and uh, over this whole thing, and that was all part of God's plan? Yes, because God had something greater for, for them to do. Were they very disappointed in Jesus because he didn't do what they wanted him to do? Yes, they were very disappointed. Should have they have been? No. They should have been trusting God, trusting his sovereign, trusting the character of God, and, and trusting what Jesus would do uh, as a result of all of this. But they didn't. There's a real failure in faith 
for them. And certainly we can, we can relate it to these, these two sisters. Of course, when Jesus shows up, Martha's out there and she just lays into him. She's just chewing him out. And uh, God come in the flesh. She's just chewing him out. And uh, about why weren't you here and you could have done something and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and that's when he says to, to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Do you believe this? It's like he, you will take care of your brother in a minute, but where are you at right now spiritually? She says something very interesting. Well, if you tell your, your, your you know, I believe in the resurrection, you know, the one that's in the future, <laughs> she's not really believing. She says, if you tell your father as, a, as an inferior to a superior, if you tell your father even now, you know, maybe he'll do something. <laughs> and Jesus, is, you know, again, she, you know, her comprehension of who, who Jesus is is not quite there. And he has to deal, deal with her. And of course, we know he raises Lazarus from the dead. And news spreads quickly. And it continues to spread. It's on CNN every night. It's on the front page of the Jerusalem Post every morning. If you don't believe me, let's read the passage here. John 12, 16. Uh, at first, the disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Why? Because of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So again, this proclamation is made through, uh, through the cloaks, through the fulfillment of a Jewish feast, through the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, through coming on the exact day that Daniel had prophesied, and certainly from the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And there's one more. This proclamation is made when they refer to him as the prophet. That's in verse 11. The crowds answered, this is Jesus. Again, no the personal pronoun, the prophet from Nazareth in, in Galilee. There have been many Jewish prophets, but he's not a prophet. He's the prophet. Moses had said at a point in time in Deuteronomy 18 that there would be another prophet like me coming after me. He would be the prophet. And when he comes, you better listen very explicitly to everything he says and, and do it. And, and so the people had always been looking for not just one of the prophets, but for this prophet, the one that Moses spoke about. That's in Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. And then he goes on and makes that even more, uh, more explicit. Uh, that uh, is so necessary that they, they listen to this prophet when he comes. Uh, and the crowd makes reference to that as well. Let's go on to the... Uh, the fourth aspect of this, there's a preparation for entering. There's a fulfillment of prophecy. There's these proclamations that are made as he enters. Uh, and then actually, again, when we get to verse 17, if you're a note-taker, taker, Bible underliner, you might, if you don't already have it in there, this is now the next day. This is now uh, Monday morning. Uh, and what transpires, again, Matthew arranging his information uh, topically, not chronologically. What has transpired is that the next morning, and we'll look at it next week, Jesus curses the fig tree. It's not bearing fruit, so he curses it and it shrivels. It's a representation of the nation of Israel. They bore no fruit and they're, they're going to be cursed. Uh, Jesus now comes to the Mount of Olives, to that staging area. Uh, and we know from John's gospel that he weeps over the city. Uh, and when it says that Jesus wept, it means that he sobbed uncontrollably as he looks over the city. And he begins to, to realize, because of their rejection, uh, what's going to happen, the destruction that will come, and certainly it did uh, within a 40-year year period. It's, it's after that, now they move into the city and they go into the, to the, trim, uh, the, uh, the temple proper area. As you look for, that's kind of the classic picture uh, is, uh, of Jerusalem. It's usually from the Mount of Olives looking down into the old city, uh, and you have the, uh, the Temple Mount area. To kind of put that in context, the Temple Mount area is about as big as this shopping center in terms of the, the entire parking lot uh, all the way around. It, it's, it's really large. It may even be bigger than this, but just to give you some uh, sense of size, it's like 20 or 20, 25 acres. So there's a lot of areas to it, and where Jesus is going is not the Temple proper where the, uh, the beautiful 
building that Herod had built where the sacrifices are going on and so forth. He's going to this whole other area we would call the court of the Gentiles. Uh, it's an area where you would bring, if you were Jewish, you would bring your Gentile friends so they could, they could learn more about Judaism. They could learn that there's one God who's the God of heaven. There's a way that you can know him and worship him and have a relationship with him and so forth. And it's in that setting that Jesus enters uh, in, in verse 12. It says, uh, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers uh, and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. So a couple things about this confrontation. He, he confronts them by turning over the tables of the money changers and those selling animals for uh, for sacrifice. It's not the, the first time he's done this. He's done this uh, a previous time, a previous visit to Jerusalem earlier on in his ministry recorded for us in John chapter 2. Uh, the idea here is that if you, if you came and you came to worship and it was one of those annual feasts, if you wanted to make an offering, it had to be in the, in the temple shekel. So uh, you, you may have had a Roman or a Greek or an Egyptian or a Syrian coin uh, from the country that you're from. So you've got to exchange it to get that temple shekel, just like you do if you're going to another, another country today. And you'll often learn that uh, there are some places that give you a better rate of exchange than others. Don't ever exchange at the airport unless you have to. They always rip you off. They charge you more, you know. And uh, <clears throat> we know all the good places in Hong Kong to go, the little walk-up windows where you can get the best deals. If you're going to buy yen, you know, before you go to Japan, there's a little walk-up window right off Kalakaua. It's a trip down there, but they give you a lot better rate than you can get from the bank and so forth. Well, there's the rate of exchange these guys had, we know from uh, historical records, was at least 25% more than it should have been. So they, they were ripping off the people. They would, they would take their money, but the money they gave them in exchange, uh, they was, uh, there was a high rate of exchange. They were making money. Uh, those selling the, the animals, again, they weren't operating a, a petting zoo there. The, this was for uh, the sacrifice. If you're traveling all the way from Iraq or Iran or from Syria or from Egypt uh, to get there, you certainly didn't want to herd along a bunch of uh, lambs with you all the way, hoping that they, they made it. So you would. It was meant to be uh, as a uh, kind of a, just a, a thing to help people out initially. You could buy a lamb, a lamb that's already been, uh, already been inspected by, by the high priest so you could use it uh, for sacrifice uh, when you went to the temple proper area. Of course, what they were doing is taking a, a lamb that might be, or turtle doves that might be worth $5, and they're going to sell them to you for $75. And you could say, well, that's okay. I'll go out here and go down the street because I saw a guy selling some down there and I'll buy those. And you bring those and they're like, ah, oh, they don't pass inspection. By the way, did I mention the only ones that pass inspection are the ones that we have for sale? And so they were, they're ripping off the people. All of these markets and all of this is owned by Annas, the, the former high priest Caiaphas, who is his son-in-law. Uh, so the, the family is just ripping ripping the people off. You go to Jerusalem today, one of the things you can visit is the, the palace of Caiaphas. They didn't live in a house. He lived in a palace. Uh, and it was well known of the people that uh, they were being ripped off. Jesus was furious uh, about this because after all, this was supposed to be a place of evangelism. This is a place where you bring your friends so they can learn about God. And what are they learning they're learning that, that people in the name of God rip other people off financially. Boy, I'm glad that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> so if you think of what Jesus did to these guys, you can, you can get an idea of, of what, what he thinks about those that are, that are uh, again, making merchandise uh, of the people of God. Secondly, he confronts them by rebuking them with the, with the scriptures. Verse 13, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a a house of prayer, but you are making it a, a den of robbers. Here he's quoting Jeremiah 7, 11 and Psalm 8, 2. Uh, but notice a couple of things. 
Whose house did Jesus say it was? His house. What is it? It's the house of God. Now, one thing, if you've got an NIV, uh, you'll note that uh, in that uh, uh, opening verse, in verse um, 12, it says, Jesus entered the temple area. Now, that, that's accurate in a sense because he wasn't in the temple proper, and the translators are trying to help you know he's, he's not there, but he's in this big you know, uh, Solomon's porch and the portico and where the money changers were, uh, where everybody could come in. But in, in the majority of the manus Greek manuscripts, it doesn't say he entered the temple area. It says he entered the temple of God. And that's important because now he's going to say, it's the temple of God and it's my house. So what does that make, uh, make me? Uh, so again, he's uh, quoting Jeremiah when, uh, when he does that. And what does he say? What is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be called a house of prayer where people can come in with their, their, their concerns, their problems, the, the things that are on their hearts and, uh, and come before the Lord and ask for God's mercy and God's intervention. And, and that wasn't happening. So he confronts them by rebuking them with the scripture. Then he confronts them by healing the blind and the lame. We see, again, a fulfillment of Isaiah 35. And Jesus continues to do this on many occasions simply because of his compassion but he, one more time, he authenticates his miracle working power. And then, I like this, he confronts them, fourthly, by asking a question about the praise of children. Chief priests and the teachers of the law, it says, saw the wonderful things you, that he did. We think these are wonderful things you're doing, and we hate your guts and want to kill you, that we might put it in the vernacular. I mean, it's just kind of goofy, crazy. They, they don't, none of these guys, his worst critics and enemies, never deny his ability to do miracles. They never deny that. It's right in front of them. Uh, but the, what they do is they say he does it by the power of Satan, but they never deny his miracles. Uh, and so they ask him a question here. And so very typical Jewish, he responds by asking them another question. Uh, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes. Have you never read? <laughs> and, and, you know, they just, the question, question, back, uh, back and forth. Uh, and he's saying that uh, what the children are doing here uh, in, in terms of what they're saying and everything and, uh, and, and worshiping and blessing them. And notice it's children and, and infants. Uh, he says, and he's quoting Psalm 8 too. What they're doing here is a fulfillment of, of prophecy. Again, he's in this, uh, again, the, the temple area. Uh, there's uh, the place is jammed with people. Would be anyway, even if Jesus wasn't there just because it's Passover. But it's different. They're supposed to all be somber and everything. But people are going ballistic. They're celebrating. They're worshiping. Jesus is here. He's the Messiah. He's the king. He's, he's ridden in on the donkey. You know, we've, he's the fulfillment of the, the, the feast of Sukkoth and everything. Uh, he's here doing miracles. He's healing the blind. He's healing the lame. These kids... These little kids are all around Jesus, and they're they're singing and everything. It had to be, you know, quite quite a scene. And and it, and again, the, the kids are comfortable, you know, with Jesus. There's just nothing nothing threatening. There's nothing. Hey, get away from me, kid. We're doing busy stuff here. You know, it's for the you know adults. You know, I mean, the kids are quite comfortable, and he's there and he's welcoming them. And then and with all that celebration and all that's going on, then you've got the chief priest, you know, on their their robes. I should show a couple of little. Uh, video clips and, and stuff from some movies that are done just to give you a sense of it. I mean, the regalia and the, and the pomp and ceremony that surrounds these guys as they make their way through the temple and their flowing robes and, uh, and so forth. And, oh, the, high, the chief priests. And, and they're the ones, and they're just railing on, on Jesus at this point. And he's coming back very pointedly uh, with a, a confrontation, a question uh, back to them. Uh, in Matthew 26, verse 4, it says, And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. What they don't want to do is going to happen because God is in charge of all of these events. Jesus said, nobody takes my life. I, I give it freely. And even these children, even the, uh, that are around him, are, are a fulfillment of, of prophecy. Now, again, this is on a Sunday. It's four days before Passover. And the, and the other significant thing here is this. What's going on in the temple, the other part of the temple right now, is that all of the lambs that are going to be sacrificed uh, on the, and, and we're talking um, a couple of hundred thousand lambs, so there's enough for, for every, every family. This is no small deal. Uh, they are now being inspected by the high priest. They have to be without spot, without blemish. They have to be genetically 
good to go right from birth, and they could have never been injured uh, along the way. And they're all being inspected on this day. And on this day, the Lamb of God, Jesus the Messiah, is being inspected also one final time uh, by the people. But again, but the leadership of the people continued to, to reject uh, him. Uh, he is the Lamb of God that would come to take away the, the sins of the world. That You know, we reread this, we go through this, and it, it all seems pretty obvious, <laughs> doesn't it? When you just kind of th 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 go through the prophecies, the facts, and, uh, and everything. Uh, and yet, these guys miss it all. And certainly, there's people around us this time of year as we approach Christmas, and they may be singing Christmas <laughs> carols. They'd be singing about the deity of Christ, Christ being born, uh, and so forth, uh, putting up scenes, looking at scenes of the three wise men coming who say, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. Oh, yeah, we love those wise men, the ones that worship Jesus. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, the, the non-believer, I mean, they, they can, you know, they, they're into the, the gifts and the, you know, the other aspects, but there's a, there's a part of this where it's all around them, but they, they, they miss the whole thing. Uh, it's much, much like so many in, in this crowd. Uh, a psychologist uh, uh, did a very interesting study. His name is uh, Richard Wiseman. He did an experiment uh, where they bring in a group, a test group of people, uh, and they, they show them a 30-minute film. And in the film, there's, a, there's a, a basketball team. There's a basketball game going on. Uh, and he says, I, watch, I want you to watch this. It's, a, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not real, real fast. It's 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I want you to count the number of times the ball is passed from one player to the other. Boom, 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 boom. So they're all, they're all like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. And in the middle, in the middle of the 30 seconds, a guy in a gorilla outfit runs into the middle of the camera, goes, and then runs out. And then afterwards, they interview them individually. And they, they say to them, did you see anything unusual? No, 67 passes. That's what I've got. Yeah, you see anything else? No, I'm pretty sure that's the number. You didn't see anything else? No, what are you talking about? The majority of the people never saw the gorilla. <laughs> They're so caught up in what we might say the mundane or focused on just a certain level of things. It's like you kind of miss the obvious. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, in the crowd... They're, they're caught up in the fact that the fulfillment of prophecy and their anticipation of what Jesus would do, and they, uh, they, miss, they miss the obvious. But we know they, they do hear the gospel later. As Peter preaches, 3,000 uh, come to faith um, that first day at Pentecost, 50 days later, uh, you know, and the, and the church begins to grow. They, they do get it in time. I think our concern for us is, is that there are those folks around us at this time that... Uh, uh, caught up in the mundane or the busyness of Christmas, but, but miss, the, miss the Messiah. They might even, like this crowd, proclaim a lot of the same things, but still reject him uh, in the end. And that needs to be a, a concern and a, a, and a prayer for us. John 1.11 said, He came to his own, uh, but his own did not uh, receive him. Sure as gold is precious and the honey is sweet.
the holy place where we can enter in by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has given us atonement for our sin. We'll